Turn, if you will, to Genesis 40, and you can remain seated. We're going to read the entire uh, chapter, and uh, it's a, a longer chapter. So uh, remain seated, but put your heart into a position of reverence for the reading of God's holy word. Um, the one thing I can tell you uh, absolutely positively about the, the uh, Bible is that it is a, a light to my world and a, a lamp unto my feet and that the Word has lived and grown with me as I have lived and grown. And uh, to watch the living Word, I've heard people call it all living Word, living Word, living Word, but uh, it takes years of living with it to actually start really understanding what that means. And, uh, but once you do start understanding what that means, the, the power of God's Word is a humbling, humbling thing. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Usually it calls, it calls him Pharaoh, but it calls him king this time. That's just an interesting side note. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison. Everybody knows what a cupbearer is? Okay, they test the uh, food and the drink of the king. So, and uh, which, uh, if you've read your, your more, your older history, kings were always in danger of being assassinated. So this was quite a job, and it was a job of high esteem. Um, and it paid, paid very, very well. He's probably one of the richest men in the, in the country. Had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. So these two men had a dream. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him, uh, with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So is he a dream interpreter? Or is he something else? He's something else, isn't he? So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. And uh, the King James says that as soon as it, before, as it was but budding, but before it was actually budding large enough to produce a blossom. And so this is all happening very quick on this vine. Pharaoh's cup was in his hand, was in my hand, and I took the grapes. Now, no, who's, who's doing the work here? The cupbearer. He took the grapes, squeezed them into the Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup into the Pharaoh's hands. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, this is the only thing Joseph's asking. It's the only thing he's asking. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me some kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. <laughs> now, what, why, why did he go to him? Because he had a favorable interpretation, right? Y'all remember some of your other dream interpretations from Scripture? The wise men of the king would give him favorable interpretations, but it was always the God-fearing man who told him news he didn't want to hear. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream on my head with three baskets of bread. I'm trying to imagine that. I don't in the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Who's doing the action? The birds. 
What are they eating? Bread. What is bread a symbol of? This is my flesh. Yeah. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head <laughs> and impale your body on a pole. And the birds will eat away your flesh. I'm guessing he went, wished he went to a different dream interpreter. Now the third day, well, he's like, that wasn't as joyful as the cupbearers. What, what did he pay you? Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up his head of the, he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hands. But he impelled the chief baker, just as, jo just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. And this chapter ends with these three very sad words. He forgot him. Father in heaven, we praise you that your word promises that you will never forget us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Forsake us. We are your children. We are your army. Give us our shielding. Give us our armor. And give us the power of the sword. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I stared at this story for a very, very long time. What should I preach, I asked myself. I'm in the mood for some uplifting. How about you? I've done fire and brimstone and pick up your cross for a good while now. Time for some just happy, simple love from God, I think. But as I stared at this story, it wouldn't let me do it. I mean, if we think about it, the only quote, the only quote, unquote, good thing that has happened in this chapter is that the cupbearer is restored to his fortunes. If you think about the entire chapter, it's the only positive thing that's really happening. But the ungrateful jerk forgets to help a brother out. I mean, can you imagine the absolute unthankfulness? I, I tried to make this make sense to myself. I tried to put myself in that position, and I thought, well, you know, I'd be so excited that I got my job back that I wouldn't mention it right then, probably. But I'd come back later, wouldn't you? As soon as reality settled back in. Perhaps he was just so excited in the moment, and I could understand it. He was so excited in the moment that he forgot everything else. I'm free. I keep my head. The, the baker loses his head. I keep my head. I keep my job. I keep my wealth. I'm kind of excited. I know how that feels. I've been so excited that I've, I've forgotten all social etiquette and other things. You know, it talks about David dancing in front of the ark and he forgot what his surroundings for a little mi minute. So I know that feeling of either being either so devastated or so uh, ex exalted that you just forget what's happening around you. Uh, now, I have to admit, I know y'all won't believe this, but I'm an introvert. So my brain is doing very different things in a crowd than an extrovert's brain is doing. In a crowd of people, my brain is looking for the exits, surveying the potential threats, looking around for people that I know but don't want to run into. <laughs> the list goes on. Perhaps this man just had one of those heightened moments when everything else just fades away. But that really doesn't work here. It isn't like this man forgot in the moment, but forgot all week, forgot all month, forgot all year. We could have forgiven him a couple of days if it had said he came back a week later and told the Pharaoh, I've forgotten all the excitement, but Joseph, I need to remind you about him. But that isn't what happened, is it? The man was restored to his high position of authority, privilege, honor, and income. 
And so he just totally forgot his friend. As the great country singer would say, he forgot his friends in low places. <laughs> and uh, a friend in need is a friend indeed. I was watching a movie the other day and it had a great quote in it. I won't tell you what movie it was. But it, had a, it did have a great quote in it. The, uh, the guy said, uh, I'm sorry to bother you with this. And the other man leaned across the table and said, friendship isn't proved in peaceful times. He wasn't asked for money. He wasn't asked to put his neck on the line for Joseph. He wasn't asked to act as Joseph's lawyer. He wasn't asked to give Joseph any money. He wasn't asked to gather a crowd and fight for Joseph. He wasn't asked to pick it. He, wasn't a he was asked to deliver a very simple message. I believe Joseph is innocent. He interpreted my dream. He wanted me to remind you of him. It was it. How many, have any of y'all ever had a friend that sounds like this guy? Joseph interpreted a dream accurately. You would think that kind of thing would stick in your memory, wouldn't you? I mean, how selfish of a person do you have to be to miss the grandeur and wonder of the world around you? Sometimes people stink. <laughs> Some, sometimes we do rotten things. The world is full of human tragedies that could drown a sane mind if it had to ponder them all at once. I, I believe it was Lenin or Stalin or, or one of them that uh, he was asked about the millions that had been killed. And he said, oh, a handful of people die is a tragedy. Millions of people die. It's a statistic. Because our minds can't really handle it. We have loved ones in our lives and they get killed and we feel the pain. But we watch the news every day and hear of murders and wars and we sit there numb. And it's, because, it's not because we're not thoughtful and caring, it's because we can't carry all of that on our shoulders. It's more than a sane mind could handle. But that is man's disgrace, not God's disgrace. Jesus and God carry it all. The world around us, the stars above, the fathomless reaches of deep space, the infinitely small universes that hide between our very cells, the wonder of love and the wheels within wheels always turning, always mesmerizing, always ringing the music of true love and the light of God, the mere fact that I can think any and all of these things is a testament to my God and His wondrous creative order. In the worst of places, there are still ants who hide in their crevices, the hiding place. And in the wonderful open spaces, there are still eagles that soar the wind, no matter what we rotten humans are doing. In the prison cell, there are still dreamers, and in the deepest and darkest cells, there are still dream interpreters. I'm quite upset with this cupbearer. I have to admit, I'm very angry with him. But the truth is, in order to understand this story, I have to forgive him. Let us pretend to be Joseph. I'm in prison. My brothers wanted to kill me. A couple of the brothers saved my life, but they really didn't do me any favors. They sold me into slavery. I worked in a fantastic house until the wife lied about me and the husband threw me into prison. Now I helped this cupbearer out and all I asked was that he mention me and he doesn't. I wish I could be like Joseph. I wish I could follow his example, but I find myself in my imagination putting myself in that position and being crushed under the weight of my own misfortune. I could add the selfish man's trespass against me to the list of my things to be depressed about, but my list is already long enough, isn't it? 
or I can forgive him and continue to try and make my life, whatever it is, even in this prison cell, as pleasant and as God-honoring as I can because even here it's not about me. Even here it's about the people who watch me in turmoil and in pain and in suffering, and I declare to them through my actions, through my love, through my countenance, through my demeanor, through the things that I say and things that I don't say, where my faith is. Because I can be abandoned by everyone and I still have a friend. Paul said that he had found the secret. And I remember reading this as a very small child and wanting to know, Paul, I want to know that secret. And going off for the rest of my life, looking in every religious text, in every philosophy that I could find, in every schoolhouse, in every university that would take me, trying to find the secret of being content in all things. I would like to say that at the age of 51, I have fully figured it out. But this I know, the secret of contentment is no longer a mystery to me. It is the exercise of that mystery that eludes me at times. Sometimes I get it as clear as the sun on the brightest day, but other times the cares of the world seem so taxing and heavy that I forget my friend in heaven. I know how to exchange. I know how. I, I don't just think how. I don't just spiritualize this. I'm telling you here and now, I know how to exchange my yoke for the light and easy yoke of Jesus Christ. I know how to do it. But just like the game hide the thimble, sometimes I miss what is in plain sight. Joseph seems, Joseph seems all through this miraculously unperturbed. And I, I think to myself sometimes, perhaps the author just didn't add it. Perhaps he didn't put it in the story. But I start to get this sense of Joseph as somehow spiritually a step further than I am. This chapter ends with the line, He forgot him. And yet Joseph still remains Joseph. I mean, from a narrative point of view, wonderful. Uh, as a reader and as an author, I read the story and I think, what a cliffhanger. What a wonderful story. This is exciting. Do you want to be in it? No. But as an author, oh, it's wonderful. It's suspense making. It, it, it's, it's creativity at its best. It's, it's jaw dropping. It's truth is stranger than fiction. What a great narrative moment. But let's be honest, this stinks. Does that ever feel like the story of your life? You do, you do, you do, you give, you give, you give, and yet the daily summation seems to always be, and they forgot about you. <laughs> there is a truth in church, and I assume that it is a truth uh, everywhere that we go, Excellence is expected while failure is mentioned with glee. I remember when someone would be mentoring under me in the ministry and they would make some changes about the church and then come to me very, you know, want me to uh, give them a little pep talk or pat them on the back about what they'd done. But sometimes they'd come to me concerned that one of the two, one or two people complained about what they had done. I told them, oh, if one or two people complaining is going to drive you out of the ministry, you're not cut out for this. <laughs> I had to tell them the hard truth. People love complaining. Have you ever had a conversation? People love complaining. We do. And uh, thank you, Mom, because part of it, you know, y'all are thinking, are y'all talking about me? No, I'm talking about me. You get into any conversation and eventually you find yourself complaining, won't you? People love complaining much more than they love building and much more than they love complimenting. 
These take risks of self in order to give. You know that I have never cared one iota about someone doing a successful ministry over there. I've always prayed for them. I hope they do do a successful ministry. But I've never been bothered by somebody doing a ministry in the church. If I cut somebody loose on Sunday school and they're doing a good job, but it's not the way I would do it, praise God. I don't need to micromanage that. You wouldn't believe the fires that I had to put out over the years. And I hope you all find these funny and not complaining because otherwise I'll be guilty of what I just preached. <laughs> oh, pastor, pastor, someone put soda in the kitchen, pastor. I don't think Christians should let their children drink soda. Do I really have to handle this today? Pastor, someone keeps moving the trash can in my Sunday school class to the other side of the room. Do I really have to deal with this today? <laughs> Pastor, do you put up a pagan Christmas tree in your house? Yes, I do. I like the lights. <laughs> oh. And my all-time favorite. Some of y'all might remember this one. Maybe I should be careful. Pastor, Pastor! Someone changed the light bulbs and that was my job. I've never had any problem with somebody doing my job. I'm thinking what's wrong with you if you have trouble with somebody doing your job. Ever since my mommy read me about a little boy at a whitewash fence working his magic to get the neighbor kid to finish the job for him, I've been dangerous. <laughs> but ever since then, I have always known that if someone is doing my job, that means I get credit for it and I don't have to lift a finger. Am I really going to let my pride get in the way of me having a double win? I don't think so. I've watched so many people over the years do what my mother called chopping your nose off to spite your face. Stop chopping your nose off to spite your face, world. Speaking of which, did you see the latest scientific study that found that liberal woke protesters were classified narcissists who showed signs of psychopathy? Ain't it funny how long science takes to catch up with good old-fashioned God-given common sense? <laughs> anyway, this chapter has something to teach us, and I'm pretty sure it isn't Dream Interpretation 101. What do I see? I see in this story a man who has been mistreated. I see in this story a man who has been forgotten by the world. I see a man who has been abandoned by family, by friends, by employers, by country, by everyone. And yet I see a man who just keeps trucking no matter what is thrown at him. I like that. I like that. I, I want that strength more than anything. How about you? You see, the truth can sustain you. The truth can sustain you no matter what else is going on because even if you lose everything in this world, you still have a pearl of great price called the truth, the logos, the reason the world itself came into existence. And if you are in relationship with that logos, you can survive anything including death. The truth can allow you to undergo injustice, unfairness, and rejection. Am I being seeker sensitive enough for you? We fight tooth and nail for these things. Many of our young kids jo join the woke, woke movement nonsense. Many of our children join the woke moving, movement nonsense simply to belong to something. They did. Peer pressure is a real thing. And I remember 
adults teaching me about peer pressure in my teen years. You know, I, it was a, every time we had a, I, I went to a Christian school, so every time we had a, 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 a uh, a uh, chapel meeting, the, the the teacher was always talking about the preacher, the teacher, the guest speaker, whoever was always talking about peer pressure to us teens. It seemed like it's the only word you heard from teachers when you were a teen. Peer pressure is going to get you. Peer pressure. You know what I found? Adults are worse when it comes to peer pressure than children were. Have you anybody else seen that? Adults are worse with peer pressure than than teenagers or children. Peer pressure is a very real thing, and unfortunately, COVID showed us that it is something you don't age out of, and it is something that affects the world as a mass psychosis. Because most of the people that got real angry about the people standing up saying, no, I ain't doing it, the only reason they were angry is because you shed light on their darkness. COVID showed us that it's something you don't age out of. People will do what the masses tell them to do even when their very own soul cries out against them. You know how I know somebody's guilty? When they start coming to, to me trying to get me to help them rationalize it. Every time, for years, didn't they? For years, for years. Every time that lady there or I would even say the word Facebook in, in, in a service, we'd have a line of people at the door, Pastor, I think you're right on this Facebook, but I want you to know why I use it. <laughs> now I use it too. I'm using it for the kingdom, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't put a uh on anybody who does use it. It's kind of fun sometimes, isn't it? Make sure you use it wisely. That's for sure. But we were proved right, weren't we? Those people had their finger in the government. Those, thing, those people knew that they were hurting our young people and they hid the data. Those people knew they were hurting the mental stability of Americans all across this country. They knew they were adding to the suicide rate. They knew, they knew, they knew, they knew, they knew. We told them so, do. <laughs> Let me tell you something about people that I learned, uh, that, uh, uh, something that I learned about people from um, one of my favorite movies, Men in Black. There's a quote in there. People are stupid. A person is smart, but the herd is a nightmare. Did you know that many rabbis and other theologians believe that many times when the Bible is talking about chaos, the ocean, the sea. And now I want you to, I want you to hear this because this will change the way you read your Bible. Because I even want you to think about Genesis when the Spirit of the Lord came and hovered over the chaos of the deep. Because there are, I'm not saying that that is to be interpreted differently than how you think about it. It definitely is. What I'm saying is there are interpretations upon interpretations upon interpretations that all build upon the grandiose nature of our God. Many rabbis and theologians think that the Bible, when it's talking about chaos, that it's talking about, or, or when it's talking about chaos, the ocean, the sea, the giant untamed body of water that has Leviathan in it working towards chaos, that what it is talking about is humanity at large, groups of people. A person is smart, people are not. But the truth, the reason, the logos, the firm foundation, the cornerstone keeps you sane and able to survive anything once you have it. And if you remember in Job, what did, uh, what did uh, God say to Job about Leviathan? Can you tame it? Can you chain it up? God has chained Leviathan. God is in charge of the chaos. His Spirit hovers over the chaos, both the waters of the deep for creation and over the nightmare culture that we are living through now. God is still above those waters. You might sometimes forget that you can call upon it. You might have to train yourself or even leave yourself a message that reminds you that you can call upon it, but you can Jesus says that He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's quite a promise. You are never alone. You are never abandoned. You are a child and a servant of the King Most High. And if the King wants you in jail today, then you will be in jail today. 
If the king wants you in the hospital today, then you will be in the hospital today. If the king wants you home today, then you will be called home today. Everything in your life has meaning. Everything in your life has meaning. Before you meet Christ, everything is drawing you to Him. After you meet Him, everything finds its reason, its its purpose, and its illumination in Him. Can you be shaken? Well, of course you can be shaken. That is what being a disciple is about. The disciple is to be shaken less and less and less, though, over time. Peter was shaken, and he prevailed. Judas was shaken, and he failed. Whatever you are going through, and I mean whatever you are going through, and I've heard nightmares. I've heard people come into my office who, step-parents and even parents, I can't even say in a service and feel right about it, but I have heard, I have heard the lowest of the low the ugliest of the ugliest. And I still have to be able in my faith to look those people in the eyes and even if they retaliate and get angry that I say it, I have to tell them, your suffering even there has purpose. It is either trying to break you enough to see Jesus Christ or it is still breaking you to prepare you for eternity within the light of God's holiness. My brother-in-law has a saying. It goes... No good deed goes unpunished. I'm going to tell you a little secret about the church world. The ones you adopt, the ones that give the most, the ones that you give the most to, the ones that take the most out of you emotionally, physically, mentally, the ones that take the most out of you are the ones that are going to eventually hurt you the worst. I'm not sure why this is. I have my theories, but none of y'all are in seminary yet, so I will give you those details during your course of study. If your hope is set in something less than Jesus Christ, then you are going to be lost, broken, depressed, easily manipulated, and unable to achieve and maintain a joyous state in this life. Will you sacrifice to the work of being salt and light? Do you have any idea how noble the cause of Jesus Christ is? I think the church has forgotten how noble a cause it is that Christians voluntarily sacrifice their lives, their honor, and their fortune to. This is no small thing that we do. This is no self-help group. This is no pat each other on the back and share our problems and leave out here feeling good for another week. That is not what we do. We come here to prepare for war in peace and in wartime to always remember that He's King of kings, Lord of lords. He has brought another kingdom into this world that is not a kingdom of this world and that the strong man of this world has been tied up, thrown out, and can't do a thing about it other than cry, kick, and scream, and have pride month. Let him. Hmm. The goal, salvation of the universe. The means, the goal, salvation of the universe. It's why we gather. I want you to, I want you to really understand what it is to be a Christian. The goal Salvation and redemption of the entire created order. The means, the crucified body of the Son of God shed for the remission of sins. The method, make disciples to fight the war between dark and light. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and get them to be a disciple. Through the blood of one man, the sin of the first man was overthrown. Through that blood, you are forgiven and asked to join the ranks of those who pick up their cross daily proud. Pastor, it says not to be proud. It says to be proud of one thing. 
Not an army that seeks to avoid the war, but rather an army equipped properly to fight it, who marches into it with their head up, whether they're going against a giant with a huge spear. I still got my itty bitty sling. I got five rocks, but more importantly, I got God. An army that is coordinated through the work and duty of the Holy Spirit through the preached word that enlivens the spirit of man and brings them into harmony with the like-mindedness of the disciples. An army that does not have to be informed of all the other parts that the armies throughout the world are doing. There are armies in China. There are armies in Russia. There are armies in Africa. And there are still, thank God, many, many armies in America. It only has to obey its commands locally. If it does so, then the entire redemptive process begins to become manifest in this very space-time as a testament to the eternal promises of a life-giving God. Can you give your life to Christ? Can you give your life to Jesus Christ? Your life. He asks for nothing less. He demands nothing less. He says if you are giving less, He doesn't want you. Can you give your life, your life, your life, your money, your time, your energy, your pride, your ego, your right to yourself, can you give that life to Jesus Christ in order to join the most glorious army in the universe? Let me put that more simply. Can you join Jesus Christ in the life-giving miracle? Can you join Him... Learn to fight like Him. Learn to stand like Him. Learn to die like Him. Learn to live like Him. Learn to stand like Him. Learn to submit like Him. Can you join Christ in the life-giving miracle that saves even the unthankful and arrogant people of Egypt? Are they worth it? Because I've had a lot of people not like some of the things I say that I quote directly from the Scripture about woke movement and sexual identity and these kind of things. I get people very upset. But the truth is, I do this for you. I do this for you. I do this because I'm tired of the world telling you you can chop off parts of your body in order for you to solve your mental problems when I know that Jesus Christ can help you with your mental problems and He made you the way you are. You are in direct violation of God's will doing that kind of nonsense. I, I am now, I don't want you to hear me say that our work as salt and light saves Egypt eternally. I do not know. That is in the hands of God. I am not a universalist. I believe in a hell, and I believe that some people are going to bust hell wide open. <laughs> Brandon. But something wonderful can be said about being the few people who maintain their character, their dignity, they stand on the truth, they buck the world system, and they suffer publicly and joyfully for the kingdom of God and for the name of the names above all names, Jesus Christ. The warnings are in the air, folks. I, I, I hear the warnings. The warnings are in the air. The signs and, and the fruit is beginning to sprout on the trees. I pray. I don't know about you, but I pray to avoid persecution, don't you? I pray to avoid it. But I will not shirk my duties as a citizen of the kingdom of light if I am called to something less than the comfort my flesh desires. My spirit is now in control because it was born anew within fire and blood. My spirit, while in control, also willingly submits to His Spirit that gave me birth of this Spirit. In my most spiritually advanced moments, and I am renewed daily by the promises of my King. Christ asks nothing less of you than that you become a hero. The hero that He always meant for you to be. No good deed goes unpunished. My brother-in-law is right. If experience over these years tells me one thing, it is that. No good deed goes unpunished. But what a glorious punishment. 
this used to aggravate me so much, but now I could nearly call my call, I could nearly call the shots like a hustler now. I still love those people that use. I still love those people that demand. I still love those people that suck life like spiritual vampires. But I am not disheartened when they yell, crucify Him. Because I've heard it all before. The pattern was laid out 2,000 years ago. And it was shown to me to be glorious above all the crucify hymns that could ever be shouted. When I watch my Jesus and my Savior, I am just as impressed. Mm. They did the same for my Lord, and yet He still died for them. For them. We always have to come back to that. We are not here for us. We are here for the very people that are ruining the country, destroying families, destroying their bodies, who have lost their minds. We are here for them. And we all need to always remember that. When you have reached the end of your day, your month or year, and it feels as though your chapter ended with, and they forgot all about me, you remember this. There is coming a day when they will need your God connection once again. There is coming a day, perhaps years down the line, when they will remember the joyful man from prison block A. They will recall the small dream interpreter who prayed over every meal in prison. They will not always forget, and when they do remember you, that seed that you planted all those many moons ago back in prison block A may blossom into the very salvation of Egypt itself. And I don't want to give any spoilers, but there's another chapter to go. The darker, the darker and more depressing your situation is, the more glory God is planning to make of it if you will allow Him to give you peace right here, right now, in that cell. Sing to the Lord, how great is His name, how mysterious are His ways. His Word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. His smile is the sunshine I wake up to and His wrath shakes the foundations of the earth. And He is on my team. Be someone's salt this week. Be somebody's light this week. Show even vile Egypt that you don't care that it forgot you because your name is written in the very book of life. If you are watching online and you are in the darkest pit you have ever been in, to you I say this, lift up your head to God. Feel His presence with you there, even now, where you are, no matter how dark, no matter how gloomy, no matter how much the world has forgotten you. Listen to what God says. And know that your suffering has meaning within the grand scheme of God's love for you. Christ does love you. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He forgives you. And He forgives you so much that you can forgive all the people in your world that forgot you. And you can stand. And you can live. If you need any help getting there, you can contact me through any of these forms. I'd be happy to get in contact with you in a much closer and intimate way by phone, or if you live close, I can drive to you. But you need to find Jesus. And the days are coming that we need Him more and more each and every day. The good news is He loves you. And He will be with you. And your pain and your suffering, He can turn those ashes into the most beautiful portrait you've ever seen. He is my God. He is my King.
And He has given this worthless man something to live for. Praise be His holy name. Christ is King. Amen.